We're going to continue uh, the talk from last week, which is titled Secret Life. How many of you were here last week? I want your hands up. Uh, quite a few. So some of you for this, some of the things are going to be review for you. But maybe that was the way God meant it for you because he wanted the message to really um, uh, soak in. Um, so what I'm going to do is since I introduced the topic last week, I'm going to quickly do a summary. And the people who put their hands up are going to help me do the summary. Okay, so I'm going to ask you some questions because I want to see how well you listen. But if I don't get any answers, that means you don't listen and you just fool the preachers, which means I'm not going to give the rest of the talk and we'll recess early. Okay, sounds good? Or you're going to come up here if you don't have the answer and do... Okay, so your choice. Okay. So I talked last week about the secret life. What is a secret life in the context of the talk, of course? I had lots of hands. Can, can I have the hands up again? The hands are frozen. Oh my goodness, look at it. We have liars in the audience. And this is a church. You're not comfortable dancing in the church, but you don't mind lying in the church. That's not fair. Come on, there's more of you. So, just simple, simple. What is a secret life in the context of the last week's talk? Brother Jason, teach them. Yes. In the public life is what? Okay, somebody else. Public life is what? What people see. Come on, it's simple. Uh, what is a private life then? Huh? People do, but somebody sees, and who is that? God. And you yourself obviously see that. Okay, so that's very simple. So we have a public life and we have a secret life. Okay? The secret life only you know and God knows. All right? Okay, so that was my first question. What is my second question? So why is this? private life important, based on what I taught last week. Come on, somebody, don't be shy. Jesus is waiting to listen. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so the, the simple answer is, Jesus says so, you know? You know, a lot of time parents tell the kids, kids want to know why this, why that. And sometimes parents just get fed up and they say, because daddy says so. So in this case, daddy says so. Okay? Jesus says so. He said we need to have a private life. And when we do good works, they need to be in secret. And God, who is in secret, will reward us. That's what we talked about last week. So we're going to get into more details today, and because I know I left some people confused. After last week's talk, nobody came to me or wished me or said anything about my talk. <laughs> and one brother who was, he was so fearful, but he couldn't resist. He so badly wanted to say something to me. He f very fearfully came towards me. Brother, I, I wanted to say something, but I was a little afraid. I said, please come, please come. He said, no, dear, I really enjoyed the talk. And I said, no, 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 don't worry. There's nothing wrong. You're not going to steal my reward. Okay? So I need to clarify that. You know, when is it that our reward is stolen and when is it intact? Okay? It's not every time. Now, all of you are here, right? You know, you're here to pray. Where else are you going to pray? How can you pray a public prayer in secret? It's not possible. God understands your reward is there. But if you exaggerate and if you go around telling everybody, oh, oh, you know, I go to prayer, you know, and then 
it's an issue. So it's always a matter of the heart. So we'll discuss a little more so things are very clear for you so you, you don't leave confused. And so, and so after the talk, I hope you will come and wish me and not be afraid, okay? You won't be stealing my reward. Because whether my reward gets stolen depends on how I deal with what you tell me. If you say, brother, the talk was great, and I thought, yeah, inside my heart, okay? Then there is an issue. But if I say, yeah, it's good, glory to God, it's his gift, and I shared it with you, thank you for the feedback, then no, my reward is intact, okay? So we'll clarify that further. Now, what are the consequences? This private life, if we do not keep it secret, the things that we do, what are the consequences? Sister, were you here last week? Yes. Ah, all right, you are interceding, so you're exempted. All intercessors are always exempted, okay? Sister? Were you here last week? No, take a guess. I mean, you're a smart sister. Our reward is not there. The reward in heaven is gone. And I want to really help you today appreciate the difference. Because you're probably going, I mean, what's the big deal? I mean, I get my reward here. And what is it with God? Why is he cannot, why? See, you know, people in, film, you know, uh, Bollywood and Hollywood, they get, for the same movie, don't they get awards from Filmfare, Z Awards, X Awards, Y Awards? So why does God be so exclusive? Let us get our Z Awards here and let us get our Filmfare Awards in heaven. Ah, I'll explain to you why that is. You cannot have it both ways with God. Things work a little differently in the kingdom of God, as you already know. Okay? They work differently in the world and differently in the kingdom of God, which I will discuss with you shortly. So first, let me explain to you how the reward system works. The world versus the kingdom. In the world, we all know. We went to school, right, all of us? And we all know when we will get a good score. What we need to do to get a good score? If we get a good score, we get a A. If we don't, B, C. And if we don't do it, we fail. So we know exactly how the system works. And we work hard so we will pass, so we will get that reward, correct? And we get rewarded. How does it work? And in fact, the board exams, what happens? Our results are published in the newspapers for everybody to see. And everybody calls and goes, oh, great job. And they call your parents, great work. You know, uh, you must be proud and so on. And everybody's happy and they celebrate in public. Right? That's how it works. How does it work in your workplace? The same way. You know. You know because you have an appraisal. You know if you do this and if you do this, you're going to get promoted. You'll get a raise. So you work for that reward. And it's public. In the workplaces, if you're a hardworking guy or a hardworking girl, and you don't make noise about how hard you work, guess what? You'll remain a hardworking man and a hardworking woman that's never recognized. You just keep going. Like they say. Okay, that's, that's basically in Konkani that means that nobody will, you know, you'll become seed for future, which means nobody will care. So we are encouraged in the world. You have to blow your horn. You have to blow your trumpet. Not the trumpet in the US, okay? The other trumpet. You need to tell people, I've done this. You need to send an email and make sure you CC the whole office. Anybody's done that? Okay? CC everybody, as many people as you can, especially your bosses. So you know, you know, I've done this. Ah, oh, the exact opposite in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, you do something good and you keep it secret. Secret. Don't tell anybody. My question to God is, why, Lord? What is this? Reverse logic. Everything. We know how it works in the world. Why couldn't you have you adopted the same system? Now we have to learn a new system. And at work we have to do one thing. In school we have to do one thing. 
And then in our spiritual life, we have to do something else. But God says, get used to it. Because my kingdom is not of this world. This world doesn't belong to me. I'm not the king of this world. I'm the king of God's kingdom. Somebody else is the king of this world. So the rules are different. And there is a reason why the rules are different. See, everything is, there's a lot of paradox in the Bible, you know. If you want to become rich, you have to be poor. If you want to be exalted, you have to be humble. You want to live, you have to die. You want to be the first, you have to be the last. Everything is ulta in God's kingdom. In the world, you blow your trumpet, here, hush. Why? That's my question. So I asked God that question, and he gave me an answer. So I'll share it with you. I'm not selfish. <laughs> ah, so to understand why God is this way, you have to understand God's nature. God's nature. What is God like? And for that, you have to go to the book of Exodus, which I'm not going to go to because you all know it. The Ten Commandments. The first commandments, God says, I am the Lord your God. I am the Lord your God. And I'm going to paraphrase, not exactly. And you need to love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. What does that mean? And then further he says, you cannot have any other God besides me. Because I am a jealous God. More jealous than your girlfriend. More jealous than your boyfriend. I want exclusive relationship. Either you are mine, all mine, or not mine at all. Exclusive relationship. You got that? God wants an exclusive relationship. He will not be number two, number three, number four. He will definitely not want to be last. He wants to be number one. And he will patiently wait for you to make him number one because he may be number five on your list today. He used to be number 100 on my list once upon a time. And now he's moved up. And it took a lot of work for him. A lot of work for me as well. And a lot of patience on his part. Imagine if he just said, what? Number 100 on your list after I've done all this for you? I'm going to cut you off. If he had done that, people do that. People do that. People don't want to give you any chances, but God gives you chances again and again, hoping that we'll move him up a couple of notches. So he wants an exclusive relationship. He wants a jealous God. Now, all of you are thinking, because I know you are all smart people. So you're thinking, what does keeping things in secret or sharing or making things public have to do with this nature of God who wants us to love him exclusively? Ha! Ah, for that, you need to understand what is it in essence when we want others to know the good works that we're doing, what are we doing and what are we saying? In essence, we're saying, what is your name, brother? Walter, your opinion of me, of my good works, matters to me more than God's, okay? And the higher your position, the more it matters. So if you're the bishop, oh, I want to, bishop to see, hey, push all those other choir members to the back. I want to be in the front. Bishop has to see me. Hmm? You understand, right? If somebody else, the president is in the room, Oh, I want to be seen by the president. So basically, when we seek the honor of men, we are committing the greatest sin 
and one of the most popular sin in the old testament who can tell me what that is after i've given you all the hints which sin am i committing when i put the opinions of men over the opinion of god idolatry the greatest sin because today we don't do that kind of classic form of idolatry i know none of you have um you know statues of buddha and ganpati and you go after prime meeting you'll go and do that none of you will do that but i'm telling you all of you are worshiping idols including myself human idols ah brother and sister i hope you approve of me oh brother and sister i hope my talk was pleasing to you please post something on facebook I want at least 20 likes. Hmm? And five comments. Only likes. I'm tired of getting likes. I want comments now. Give me lots of emoticons, you know. <laughs> so you understood, right? This is the problem. This is why God is saying Whatever good you do do it in secret because if you do it in public to please men you're putting the opinion of men before the opinion of the living God and you're committing idolatry which is the sin that God hates the most idolatry first reason second reason and you like this reason first one is a little uncomfortable bitter medicine you know my mom used to give me bitter medicine when i was small we used to get this horrible thing called the milk of magnesia i don't know those who grown up in india the newer generation won't know about it you know i don't know who invented that stuff <laughs> i used to think whether it was whitewash you know in goa they whitewash houses I think they used to just take a cup of whitewash and put it in that bottle and then just put a label and say there it is milk and why do they call it milk it has nothing no taste like milk at all it's a horrible thing <laughs> So sometimes the truth that God gives us you know like milk of magnesia but you know what they're very effective they clean our system spiritual our soul whatever is there no dirty gets all flushed out and then we're ready for god to do something good put something good and healthy inside of us so that's the first reason let me talk about the second reason why does god want this exclusive privilege of giving us this reward why why take it from him why not here well think about this do you know that the punishment that we receive here on earth is directly proportionate to the honor and dignity of the person we offend let me repeat that the punishment we receive here on earth is directly proportional to the honor and dignity of the person that we offend okay so if you kick your dog your punishment is very limited although he'll probably bite your toe off but it's not such a bad thing okay but if you kick a policeman <laughs> ah much more than just missing your toe you'll be missing your whole family for a long time and what if you offend a judge who is called the honorable judge so you get the idea right your punishment is severe you can do the same thing only a kick same intensity but depending on the dignity and honor of the person you're kicking your punishment is very different ah let's reverse that now the value of the award that you get is also directly proportionate to the honor and dignity of the person that gives you that reward 
So yeah, I appreciate this brother and what he says to me. And I'll, there is some value to it. He said, brother, give a nice talk. I, I was touched. Okay? Here, brother here. Maybe the parish priest walks in and sits and listens to my talk and he gives me a compliment. Oh, that's worth a little more. Maybe brother Anil comes in and slightly more. He's the prayer group leader and founder. The bishop comes slightly more. But what about if God, Almighty God, the infinite God, the most powerful, most awesome God, gives you that award and tells me, well done, Jamie, my servant. I gave you a talent. You used it well. And you did not take credit for yourself. You left the credit for me. And you did not seek earthly reward. You waited patiently. Here it is. Whose reward would you rather have? Who would you rather, even in the world? If you receive the Nobel Prize, is that the same as getting a, a small prize from a village sports club? Never. It's never the same. We know that common sense. So imagine God, the creator of heaven and earth who created the whole world. He's presenting you that award for that little good thing that you did. And though you were tempted to post it on Facebook, though you were tempted while doing that good work to take a le 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 selfie le 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 huh? and post it out there, you said no. This is, nobody is going to be edified by this Facebook post except my ego. So I'm going to keep it quiet. Yeah, I feel that urge. Yeah, I feel like telling somebody, I went and prayed over this person and that person was instantly healed. And they're going, I feel like telling, I want everybody to know I have this healing gift. And you resist the temptation. but And then the devil says, I have a way for you. You can share it and get your glory, but still disguise it. Give it as a testimony. Give it as a testimony. Everybody will think you're just giving a testimony. But secretly, your intention is not to glorify God and give a testimony and edify others and help others. You want to secretly convey that I did this wonderful thing. Please praise me. Please come to me. I want to be popular. So it's not just whether you do something in public it is, what is the intention? Do you know uh, what makes a sin a mortal sin versus a venial sin? Anybody can tell me one thing. One important thing. There's three criteria, but that's not the topic, so I don't want to. The most important thing that differentiates between an ordinary venial sin and a mortal sin is intent. Can you all say intent? Yes. Intent. Motivation. What was your motive? And that's what when you go to the, in front of a judge, they try to determine your motive. That's why they call it premeditated murder. Was the, was the motive there to murder? Or oh, it just so happened. The motive was there to just punch him in the nose, and, but accidentally the person got killed. And your punishment is different. It's not mortal sin. But if you had intent to kill, it becomes a mortal sin. In the same way, whether or not you lose your reward in heaven is not that because, thing, because there are so many things that have to be done in public. Look at Mother Teresa, her ministry. I mean, how could she do what she did in secret? Fearing that, oh no, if people see, I'll lose my reward. She has to do what she needs to do. And her work happens to be in public, out in the streets. But she never sought recognition. Recognition sought her. She never sought popularity. Popularity sought her. She never sought money. Money sought her. And here's the irony. Whenever you seek greatness, greatness flees from you. Whenever you shun greatness, greatness pursues you. 
You've had that, you know, guys do that. Act hard to get with girls, right? When you're easy, they don't seem to appreciate you. When you act hard to get, they come after you, right? Same thing with blessings. If you seek them, they'll run away. If you say, it doesn't matter. I'm doing this for God. It's my duty. Besides, Jesus said in that parable, if you did what I asked you, if a servant came from their work in the fields and said, what would you do? Would you say, come and sit at my table? No, you will say, first serve me, then you come and eat your meal. Why should I reward you for doing your duty? All of us in ministry or in our lives, in, as parents or as workers, we're doing our duty. Why do we want extra reward? But God is gracious and he wants to reward us. All he's saying is, hold your horses. Wait for that amazing ceremony. Don't be desperate. So not everything can be done in private. Some things have to be done in public. Like this ministry of mine, for example. If I'm teaching, preaching, how can I do it in private and secret? It has to. And if you like it, you will share it. Is that my fault? That's not my fault. But it is my fault. If I seek that glory, if I'm hoping constantly, I hope I'm, I mean, people uh, like me. And if, one, if I get one negative feedback, oh, my heart is broken. How can this be? I'm the best. Everybody always compliments me. Something is wrong with her or him. By the way, I did get a correction last week. It was a very good correction. And I want to quickly um, correct that because last time I gave an example of how sometimes people in prayer groups under the disguise of praying for people basically stimulate gossip. And I mentioned charismats. So the person told me, you, you know, your example was good, but you shouldn't have mentioned charismats. I, so I'm sorry if I offended any charismats, but I'm also a charismat. And I also fall into that trap. What I meant was generally prayer group people. That's what I meant. Because normal Sunday-going Christians, they neither ask for prayers nor do they pray generally. They're just like into their own thing. But it's only more of the prayer group people who tend to pray and want to ask for prayers. So what I meant is we need to be aware sometimes because we don't know in subtle ways we do these things, not realizing. In subtle ways, so we have to really understand the intent. When I'm giving a testimony, is it to edify God, glorify God? Is it to encourage brothers and sisters? Or is it to secretly seek glory for myself? Look how God is using me. Look how powerful I am. Look how anointed I am. How do I take this and apply this to my life? This is good to know, right? I mean, it, it was good for me to know and be reminded. Because we just get into the routine and we don't realize. Because like I said, we are people of the world. We spend a lot of time in the world. In the world, things work differently. So we have to be really disciplined and we have to be in the word of God to realize, oh, this is different. What the world wants, what God wants is different. And awareness is the biggest thing. This has sort of woken me up. To be aware, it is not enough to do good works. But to do them the right way and which is not to seek glory. And there are some things we can, by the way, do in secret and we have to remember that. For example, giving alms or tithing. Do we need to tell people? What would be gain by telling, oh, I gave so much to so and so? No need. Quietly, just as Jesus said, let the left hand not know what the right hand is doing. And yes, last time I gave you that interpretation. Basically, the right hand Symbolic symbolizes the intention to do good, which is put within us. The desire to do good is put within us. That's why Jesus died for us. Not so we could say, I'm saved, sit on the Walter and I'm saved. Right? He's saved us so we can say, wow, now that I'm saved and I have the Holy Spirit living in me, I want to do something good. I want to be a better husband, I want to be a better uh, son, a daughter, a better worker, better community leader, a good citizen. It has to push us outwards. 
You know, Pope Francis is very keen, and he really is serious about Christians wanting to, getting out of their comfort zone. He talks about mummified Christians. You know what a mummy is like? He's saying many of the Christians are mummified. They're mummies. They're just there, smelling good because a lot of ointment has been put on them and chemicals. But they're not effective. They're not doing anything. Some are stubborn. Some are double-minded. You know, I get the healing here, so I'm here. Next day, deliverance there, I'm over there. And something else over there. We just run. We, we, and it's all for us. Parochial. We live in sort of this cocoon. You know, me and my prayer group. I'm for Apollos, I'm for Paul. That's what Paul said. Did we get baptized in the name of Apollos, Paul, Brother Anil? Brother Jamie, Brother Rohan, did you get baptized? In the name of Brother Rohan, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Did they say that? In the name of the Brother Jamie, Brother Rohan, and Brother Anil, I baptize you. No, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So who is important? Who is important? God. Okay? Now, something I want to give you an exercise to do, practically. Okay, now that you've learned this, this is amazing, you know. Now you're looking, and I, I'm happy that you're looking interested. Imagine if I was a financial advisor, okay? And, you know, like they put this thing, whenever there's a talk, they put it either on Facebook or they send an email and they put the name in. Instead of, you know, Secret Life, Jamie DeMello, it said, imagine I'm Jamie DeMello, but I'm a big financial advisor. It said, learn to quadruple your wealth in 30 minutes, Jamie DeMello. Oh, this place would be packed. <laughs> I'm telling you, this place would be packed. I will give you the secret, and I began, you know. There, are, there is one secret that nobody knows, or if they know, they've been ignoring it. If you did that one thing, you can quadruple your treasure. You'd be always saying, tell me, now. <laughs> don't give me your side stories and jokes, I don't have time. Just give me the thing, let's get to the business. That's what you do. Well, I am a financial advisor. And I have this advice from the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the greatest investor of all time. By the way, Jesus cares about money. Huh? You may think, ah, oh, you know, money is outside. For here, no money. Everything has to be free. Dinner free, biryani free, uh, talks free, books free. You ask Christians to pay five paise, which are no longer in existence, and neither are 1,000 rupees, <laughs> and neither are 500, it's the younger sister, all gone. Uh, sorry, I, I need to tell you this. I, I, w I went for my mother-in-law's funeral. I just came back last night. And if you want the most profound sermon ever, attend a funeral. Not from the priest. The funeral itself is an amazing sermon. It'll change your life. And the most touching part for me, the transforming part, of course, as a human, I'll forget in a month, okay? But it had an impact, was when we were in a cemetery and they were lowering my mother-in-law's body in that gaping hole in the ground. In Dubai, nobody dies. Have you noticed that? Nobody dies, they only migrate. <laughs> because I'll keep hearing, where is that brother? You know, I have not seen, oh, migrated to Australia. Where is that sister? They're not, Migrated to New Zealand. What is that other young girl who's the there? Oh, went to the U.S. to Harvard. You know, they just migrate. They don't die only in Dubai. That's a beautiful, that's why the whole world comes to Dubai. Because nobody dies. <laughs> you go to Goa, like a place like Goa, every month somebody, down, down, down. I used to wonder, what is this? Those are bells reminding you that you're a mortal. Because you're there in your Mercedes, your Scorpio, your uh, bullet, your whatever, for <laughs> you're driving. 
And you think I'm invincible. I'm going to be living till 160. So God is saying, I need to wake this guy up. So he does. Down, down, down. John, when will you wake up? Mary, when will you wake up? The time is near. Closer than ever before. Before it's too late. Put oil in your lamp. But nobody listens. Oh, and this nonsense, the church, dang, dang, dang. Can I not send a WhatsApp? Somebody died with Google Maps. So I can quickly go there, get it done. I'm telling you, when I saw that grave, it put everything in perspective for me. Everything. My work, my family, all my troubles. And that, as I looked in, I said, that's where I'm headed. And I'm now 55, so I'm closer than ever before. <laughs> and I said, I'm worried about so many things. And suddenly I realized, I've got to do more. I need to do more of good works. I need to do good because I'm getting closer. You know, this world is slightly moving away from me. You know, like during sunset, you know, the sun kind of moves away. The earth moves away from the sun. In that way, I'm sort of seeing, you know, the world is moving away from me. I'm getting closer to judgment. And God is going to ask me, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? Did you seek my glory or did you seek your own glory? Were you a light of the world shining on others or were you shining the light on yourself? Selfie. Another selfie. And I realized all of this. I said, here, my mother-in-law is getting buried. Outside, the 1,000 rupees and 500 rupee notes are getting buried. These definitely are signs for me. Because your treasure, you know, all this work that we do. I mean, who would have thought? I mean, if you're a really crooked-minded black marketeer, I mean, can you imagine? Suddenly, you thought, ah, like that rich man who had this harvest. He built all these big go-downs and sat one is Walter with a big, you know, beer in his hand and said, ha. Ah. And God said, tonight, I will be asking you to come to me. Okay? All these people were sitting with that black money thing. I'm rich. I'm powerful. I can do this. I can do that. Whoosh! Kadak chai. <laughs> Gone. You have to be familiar with Indian news to understand that joke, Kadak Chai. Okay? Gone. Jesus said, do not... What? Somebody said, do not accumulate treasures here on earth where moth and rust destroy. But treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. Robbers don't break in and, and steal. You understand? And why is that? Because wherever your treasure is, there where your heart will be. If you're stuck on the treasure, your heart is on that treasure. It cannot be on God. And how will you accumulate treasures in heaven? By doing good works and keeping them secret. So when you give money next time, you go back home or give a donation to the church, don't ask them. Put a big plug in there. Put Francisco Cutino, Remelo, Fernandez de Souza, son of, father of, uncle of. So everybody knows what a generous our grandfather was. No, just do it quietly. Go, you have to go to somebody. You cannot just throw the money and come back, right? The Sakistan will take it. Okay, the sacristan will take it. Okay, so you do have to speak. Tell the priest, please, no fuss. This is what I'm giving anonymously. And that is what we need to do. Um, before I close, I want to give you homework. So how are you going to keep tabs on this? First of all, you have to begin somewhere. 
At the end of each day, this is what I recommend, at the end, and I'll be doing this along with you, okay? At the end of each day, do some reflection. Give 10 minutes for your secret life, to analyze your secret life. At the end of the day, before you fall asleep, okay? There must be some energy, all right, you, to do this. On your piece of page, create two columns. One is for the good work. So you list out all the good works you did that day. Somebody was really feeling sad, down low, you went and comforted that person. Somebody was, it was really irritating you. Normally, you would have blown your top. But you were patient and forgiving and merciful. Maybe somebody needed some financial help and you gave them some money. All these good works. Your wife was nagging you. Normally, you break some utensils. Okay? Today, you just said, it's okay. She's upset. There's a reason why she's upset. So many things. Maybe in ministry, you did something. Nobody knows. Okay, I'll get to that. So you just list, and you'll be amazed. You might think right now, oh, I have no, all my secret life is full of bad things only. There are no good things. But trust me, there are good things. Everyone does something good. But until you actually note it know, and reflect on it, you won't realize how much good you are doing. So you put that on in column A. In column B, you need to now score it. How are you going to score it? Depending on how many people know about that good work. So now you ask, how many people know? Oh, sister, sister Jane knows. I shouldn't have told her, you know. And then brother John knows. And then brother Stephen. And then just at the last minute on the way, I met so-and-so and I had to blurt it out to her. So, so give yourself zero for that. Okay? Anda. Give yourself a zero. Go to the next one. And there, I said, oh, wow, this was very nice that I did. You know, a true Christian. I worked in the Christian way. How many people did I tell? Oh, nobody. Well, what about the status of it? Then check for intent. Was my intent to get popular? Was my intent to be recognized? And sometimes we don't have an intent to be recognized, but we know the real intent if somebody doesn't recognize us and the way we react. You know? So I may not say, oh, I may say, oh, it doesn't matter, man. After the talk, somebody comes and says, brother, good job. It doesn't matter. But you know what, when I'll really find out whether how, how humble I am and whether I really don't like people to praise me, if when nobody actually says anything and I'm going home, that means I wanted something because I'm so sad, I didn't get it. So be honest with yourself, rigorous honesty. Be honest. And so maybe first day you'll get all undoes. Don't feel bad. Okay? Next day, Start to observe how you, how you do the things. So make a list. next day you'll have all your good works again. And by the way, your good works will also increase. Huh? Because suddenly now you realize, oh man, I have, to have a, I have to build up a secret life. You know, like a debit and credit column. All my debit and credit, everything in public only. Nothing in secret, only debits. All my nasty stuff is in secret life. No good stuff at all. And you need to start increasing that good, good works. Start to do something good. Okay? Because Jesus is going to come and he's going to look at that column in the secret area, not in the public. So you have to put something in there. So inc you'll start increasing the good works. So you list the good works. The second day, you'll be surprised. You'll get some ones and twos, maybe threes and fours. But as you observe it, as you pray... And you ask the Holy Spirit to help you do what Jesus has asked you to do. Jesus is a very fair legislator. He will never legislate something and not give you the ability and power to do it. Like some central governments do, no? They will just tell the state government, do this, do that, but they won't send the funds. Jesus is not like that. Everything he asks us to do, he gives us the power. He gives us the grace. He gives us the tool. He gives us the word. He gives us the sacrament. So we have everything we need to be able to do those things. So pray and ask the Lord to help you increase your score. And then watch what happens. And then you're comfortable. Down, down, down. Now you're not worried because your good works are increasing. Your score is going up. Anytime, Lord, I'm ready. God bless you.